Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Carrie Parker. This is episode 329 for June 19th, 2023. And we've got a new show for you this week. Uh, maybe fewer stories than normal by a little bit. Uh, some of them are a little bit longer. Before we get into that real quick, I know that Apple just announced a bunch of really cool new privacy and security features for Macs and iPhones. Uh, that won't be coming out to this fall, really, uh, and they are subject to change, so they're not even available yet, unless you really want to get on the betas, which I'm not encouraging anybody to do, unless you really know what you're doing. But when those actually come out, which will probably be September, maybe October, uh, when those come out, we'll talk about them more then. But I've got some news stories for you, most of them not good. Start off with the Clop ransomware on the Move It uh, hack. Uh, I got a couple different articles about that one. Uh, I failed to mention a gigabyte motherboard um, vulnerability that was pretty darn important that was uh, found two or three weeks ago, I think. Uh, there has been some updates on that. Uh, they've got a fix ready for that, so I'll, I'll tell you what to do there. I want to call some attention to Congress and the intelligence agencies here in the United States. It's a good time to contact your Congress critter. Uh, they are debating Section 702, which is supposedly a foreign intelligence spying law that has been unfortunately used to surveil U.S. citizens. Also a disturbing article from the ACLU about how donated blood was used in DNA tests by the police. If you've seen the movie Catch Me If You Can, uh, one of the things that Abagnale did in that movie uh, and, and, and in real life was wash a lot of checks to write bad checks. And we'll talk about what that means. Apparently, it's happening again. People don't use checks much today. But if you do use checks and you send those checks in the mail, uh, you're going to want to listen to this. Also on the rise, uh, virtual kidnapping scams. AI, particularly audio AI, has helped to enable this and will make matters even worse. Um, and it can be really terrifying. Um, not common, but uh, anyway, I just want to tell you like what that's about and and what you might do to prepare yourself for something like that. Then a couple quick good notes. Uh, one password is now uh, supporting pass keys and there's an interesting new plan for a cyber hotline kind of like 911 for personal emergencies. This is a 311 hotline proposal uh, here in the US for cyber help. And then this week I'm going to skip my usual dear carry question and kind of a more formal tip of the week to talk about finally <laughs> the the new promotion I have to recognize and perhaps even reward people doing good deeds and helping to improve the privacy and security of other people. So, let's get right to it. All right, first up, let's talk about this ransomware that's been going around. Uh, you're going to be hearing more about this in the news. Uh, you've already heard some of it, and it's probably going to get worse. Uh, this is another really big hack, and uh, it's got serious consequences. And there's two different articles I'm going to read to you, neither one of them really overlapping the other, but they're both about the same thing. So let me start off with this first one from TechCrunch. CLOP, that's C-L-O-P, the ransomware gang responsible for exploiting a critical security vulnerability in a popular corporate file transfer tool, has begun listing victims of the mass hacks, including a number of U.S. banks and universities. The Russia-linked ransomware gang has been exploiting the security flaw in MoveIt Transfer, a tool used by corporations and enterprises to share large files over the internet since late May. Progress Software, which develops the MoveIt software, patched the vulnerability, but not before hackers compromised a number of its customers. While the exact number of victims remains unknown, Klopp on Wednesday, and this is, I believe, last Wednesday, listed the first batch of organizations it says it hacked by exploiting the MoveIt flaw. The victim list, which was posted to Klopp's dark web leak site, includes U.S.-based financial services organizations First Source and First National Bankers Bank, Boston-based investment management firm Putnam Investments, the Netherlands-based Landel Green Parks, and the UK-based energy giant Shell. Green Shield Canada, a nonprofit benefits carrier that provides health and dental benefits, was listed on the leak site but has since been removed. Other victims listed include financial software provider Datasite, educational nonprofit National Student Clearinghouse, student health insurance provider United Healthcare Student Resources, American manufacturer Leggett and Platt. Swiss insurance company OKK, and the University System of Georgia, or USG. CLOP, which like other ransomware gangs, typically contacts its victims to demand a ransom payment to decrypt or delete their stolen files, 
took the unusual step of not contacting the organizations it had hacked. Instead, a blackmail message posted on its dark web leak site told victims to contact the gang prior to its June 14th deadline. No stolen data has been published at the time of writing, but Klopp tells victims that it has downloaded, quote, a lot of your data, unquote. Multiple organizations have previously disclosed that they were compromised as a result of the attacks, including the BBC, Aer Lingus, and British Airways. These organizations were all affected because they rely on HR and payroll software supplier Zealous, which confirmed that its MoveIt system was compromised. The government of Nova Scotia, which uses MoveIt to share files across departments, also confirmed it was affected and said in a statement that some citizens' personal information may have been compromised. However, in a message on its leak site, Klopp said, quote, if you are a government, city, or police service, we erased all your data, unquote. While the full extent of the attacks remains unknown, new victims continue to come forward. Johns Hopkins University this week confirmed a cybersecurity incident believed to be related to the MoveIt mass hack. In a statement, the university said the data breach, quote, may have impacted sensitive personal and financial information, unquote, including names, contact information, and health billing records. Ofcom, the UK's communications regulator, also said that some confidential information had been compromised in the MoveIt mass hack. In a statement, the regulator confirmed that the hackers accessed some data through the companies it regulates, along with the personal information of 412 Ofcom employees. Transport for London, the government body responsible for running London's transport services, and global consultancy firm Ernst & Young also are impacted, according to BBC News. Neither organization has responded to TechCrunch's questions. Many more victims are expected to be revealed in the coming days and weeks, with thousands of MoveIt servers, mostly located in the U.S., still discoverable on the Internet. Researchers also report that Klopp may have been exploiting the MoveIt vulnerability as far back as 2021. American risk consulting firm Kroll said in a report that while the vulnerability only came to light in late May, its researchers identified activity indicating that Klopp was experimenting with ways to ex exploit this particular vulnerability for almost two years. Uh, now that article goes on for a little bit, but I want to stop there and pick up with another article from Restore Privacy uh, about some related hacks. Oregon and Louisiana authorities have alerted their citizens that hackers have accessed and stole sensitive personal details stored in their systems. The Oregon Driver and Motor Vehicle Services informed via an alert published on its website that attackers exploited a flaw in a software product called MoveIt, which Oregon DMV has been using since 2015 to breach its systems. And this is a quote from the Oregon DMV, quote, some publicly available information was included as well as some personal information. Individuals should assume information related to their active license or ID card information is part of this breach, unquote. The agency's spokesperson, Michelle Godfrey, has shared additional information with local media outlets explaining that the breach occurred two weeks ago on June 1st, 2023, impacting roughly 90% of the state's driver's license and ID card files. This corresponds to about 3.5 million documents falling into the hands of hackers. The agency responded to the security incident two hours after the realization of the breach, locking down all systems, informing the authorities, and engaging IT experts in investigation, remediation, and system restoration works. Godfrey stated that they couldn't inform the public earlier because the internal investigation had not progressed enough to be in a position to determine what data had been compromised. Because Oregon DMV cannot determine which people have been impacted and what identities correspond to the unaffected 10%, they advise everyone that has an active Oregon ID or driver's license to assume their personal data has been compromised. In this context, every Oregon citizen is advised to remain on high alert for any transactions they don't recognize and report them to their bank as soon as possible. The situation is similar in Louisiana, where the Office of Motor Vehicles informed that they too were using MoveIt, resulting in the exposure of names, addresses, social security numbers, license numbers, and, ve and vehicle registration details for the entire population of the state, which is 4.6 million people. I assume that's probably 4.6 million drivers not just citizens. Anyway, the vulnerability exploited in MoveIt, a secure file transfer platform, is an SQL injection flaw that leads to remote code execution on exposed servers. The flaw was a zero day, meaning that it was already under active exploitation at the time of its discovery. The threat group that exploited the flaw was CLOP, a notorious ransomware gang known for performing similar supply chain compromises, such as the Go Anywhere MFT attacks in January 2023 and the Excelion FTA attacks in December 2020. In the case of MoveIt, CLOP has managed to hit high profile targets, including the gas giant Shell, BBC, and we talked about some of this in the previous article, and so on. Having the deadline for the victims to respond to the threat actors' demands by June 14th, which is last week, Klopp has already started the blackmail against several breached entities by publishing their data on its extortion portal. 
This process appears to be gradual, as Klopp has not published the data of all its victims yet. Also, while Klopp promised to delete government or city data stolen from the MoveIt hacks, it seems that Oregon DMV and Louisiana OMV do not fall into the category to be spared, so the danger for millions of people remains. All right, so this is a developing story. It's, it's pretty bad. It obviously affects a lot of people. This is another case of supply chain attack, and these are devastating because so many major companies rely on a small subset of important pieces of software, and, and when those pieces of software can be hacked, then all of a sudden it affects a lot of companies. And it's not software that this company created. It's not software that they normally... It's not software that they really have control over directly, other than to either you know use it or not use it. But a lot of cases, these are just industry standard software packages that are kind of required for business. So this is similar to the solar winds thing that we had not that long ago, and it's just another example of why we really, really, really need better standards for security. We need security by design. We need third party validation and testing. We need bug bounty programs. And we need some transparency to know which companies are using what software packages and what versions of these software packages they're using so that we can respond quickly when these kind of things happen. In the meantime, you may be getting various emails from seemingly unrelated places about potential data breaches that in the end all come back to this same hack of this move it transfer software. All right, this is a story from Tom's Hardware, and it's about a really nasty bug in gigabyte motherboards. Now, what is gigabyte and what is a motherboard? Just in case you don't know, uh, gigabyte is the name of a company uh, that makes hardware for computers. Uh, and in fact, they make motherboards, which is the main circuit board for most modern computers where the CPU and the RAM and all this other important stuff it lives. And today we're going to be talking about how these motherboards play a role in how software is loaded, in particular the operating system on most computers, and how if that is subverted, uh, very bad things can happen. Keep in mind, though, as I read this, the Gigabyte has published a software update for this. So be ready if you have a Gigabyte motherboard in your computer to make sure you get these updates downloaded and installed as soon as possible. Cybersecurity firm Eclipsium has discovered a backdoor in Gigabyte's firmware that puts 271 different motherboards at risk. These include models with Intel and AMD chipsets from the last several years, all the way up to today's Z790 and X670 SKUs. The vulnerability resides in a small updater program that Gigabyte employs to ensure that the motherboard's firmware is always current. Apparently, it's doing so via an unsecured implementation. Have you ever noticed that after a clean Windows installation, a program pops up offering to download the latest driver or firmware for you? Unfortunately, that little piece of code could provide a backdoor for criminals. Upon every system restart, a piece of code inside the firmware launches an updater program that connects to the internet to check and download the latest firmware for the motherboard. Eclipsium assessed that Gigabyte's implementation is unsafe and criminals can use the exploit to install malware on the victim's system. The big problem is the updater program resides in the motherboard's firmware, so consumers can't easily remove it. In fact, you wouldn't want to remove it. You have to have this for the, your system to boot. Gigabyte isn't the only vendor to use this type of program to facilitate firmware updates. Other motherboard manufacturers utilize a similar method, raising the question of whether any of them is safe. For example, Asus Armory Crate software functions similarly to Gigabyte's App Center. According to Eclipsium's findings, the Gigabyte Updater program pings three different sites for firmware updates. I'm not going to read you these sites, but the key thing to note is the first of these three sites is HTTP, not HTTPS. Eclipsium assessed that the updater downloads code to the user's system without proper authentication. It doesn't use any cryptographic digital signature verification or other validation methods. As a result, HTTP and HTTPS connections are vulnerable to machine-in-the-middle attacks. As a result, HTTP and HTTPS connections are vulnerable to machine-in-the-middle attacks, with the former being more susceptible than the latter. Besides connecting to the internet, Eclipsium also uncovered that the updater could download firmware updates from a NAS device, that's network attached storage, like a file server, or sometimes this little box with a bunch of hard drives in it. 
a NAS device within the local network. A malicious actor can similarly spoof the NAS and infect the victim with spyware. The updater is a standard tool among Gigabyte motherboards. Eclipsium has put together an extensive list of affected models. And if you want to read this article, there's a link to those. There are up to 271 motherboards on the list, consisting of both Intel and AMD motherboards. Some models date back to the AMD 400 series chipsets. Not even the latest Intel 700 series or AMD 600 series motherboards are safe, though. The Eclipsium has already shared its discoveries with Gigabyte, and the motherboard vendor is working on a solution to address the vulnerability. Ironically, the solution will likely arrive in updated firmware. Meanwhile, Gigabyte motherboard owners can take some measures to safeguard their systems. Eclipsium recommends users disable the App Center download and install feature inside the motherboard's firmware. The option is what initiates the updater. For good measure, users can implement a BIOS-level password to protect unwanted malicious activity. Last but not least, users can block the three sites from the, uh, that the updater contacts. I don't think any of that, honestly, is something that most people <laughs> know how to do. That's pretty technical stuff. But here is the update as of last week. Gigabyte has deployed new firmware that mitigates the firmware backdoors. The firmware updates, which are available at Gigabyte's official website, are online for consumers to download and update their motherboard. Now, that's not really clear whether it seems like this mechanism should be in place to automatically go grab those updates for you. But I would still, you know, if you have a Gigabyte motherboard in your in your PC, uh, you should probably read the details of this article and make sure that you get your devices updated with that new firmware as soon as possible. Now, how likely is it that you're going to be affected by this? Honestly, probably not. Someone's going to have to figure out a way to tell your computer to download and install malware instead of this update. From everything I've seen, this is not going to be a general kind of an opportunistic, you know, broad spray attack. Uh, so you will probably need to be targeted for this. And let's face it, most of us aren't worth targeting. I suppose if somehow the bad guys were able to compromise the fixed web addresses that I didn't read to you from this article, you know, that would obviously be extremely problematic, but that would also be difficult to do. What they really need to do is figure out some way to spoof your system into going to a site that they think is that site and being a man in the middle or a machine in the middle attack. And that's would be more of a targeted thing. All right, let's move on. Uh, this next one is from CyberScoop, and this is about Section 702. And I've actually been trying to get somebody to come on the show to talk about this. Uh, but in, in lieu of that, let me read this article, and I'll just talk to you a little bit about this. Lawmakers and U.S. intelligence officials clashed at a Senate judici judiciary hearing Tuesday, this is last Tuesday, over how to reform a controversial surveillance program set to sunset at the end of this year, setting the stage for a difficult legislative battle to renew or potentially reform the law. Representatives of the Justice Department and the FBI made the case that, that the long history of the abuses linked to Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, are already being addressed by significant new reforms instituted in the last two years. But several members of the, of the Judiciary Committee questioned whether these reforms go far enough and pressed witnesses about potentially more serious reforms, including a warrant requirement for using the sensitive intelligence data. And this is a quote from the Senate Judiciary Chair Dick Durbin from Illinois. And he said, quote, I will only support the reauthorization of Section 702 if there are significant, significant reforms. And that means, first and foremost, addressing the warrantless surveillance of Americans in violation of the Fourth Amendment, unquote. The hearing sets up what is an uphill battle for the Biden administration to get Congress to renew the authority without changes. The administration and its surrogates insist that failing to renew the law would have grave national security consequences. Ahead of Tuesday's hearing, Biden administration officials detailed severally, several newly declassified examples of se Section 702's usefulness in combating cyber operations and narcotics trafficking. But that argument has so far failed to gain traction on the Hill. Lawmakers at Tuesday's hearing were largely united in opposing a clean reauthorization, ar arguing that the intelligence community hasn't shown that it can self-correct a history of serious abuses or show that current systems don't merit greater reforms. And this is a quote from Senator Mike Lee of Utah, quote, Why should we ever trust the FBI and the DOJ again to police themselves under FISA when they've shown us repeatedly for more than a decade that they cannot be trusted to do so, unquote. The Judiciary Committee, boy, that's hard to say. The Judiciary Committee members aired a variety of, ref of reform proposals, including a warrant requirement for Section 702, adding an adversarial process to the FISA system and assigning amicus curiae, to targeted individuals who can otherwise not challenge their surveillance, all proposals that Tuesday's witnesses opposed. 
At the heart of lawmakers' concerns is the FBI's use of Section 702, which is designed to collect data belonging to foreign intelligence targets whose communications transit U.S. communications infrastructure to query data incidentally collected on Americans. Committee members raised concern about the FBI's history of abusing incidental collection, citing a court ruling declassified last month that showed that the FBI misused the powerful, the powerful surveillance tool more than 278,000 times. Now, I'll, I'll come back to that number in a minute. The Justice Department's Assistant Attorney General for the National Security, Matt Olson, said that these abuses predate reforms undertaken by the agency in 2021 and 2022 and that the Bureau's policies would prevent them from recurring. These reforms include requiring agents to opt in to search data, something that was a driving factor in reducing U.S. person queries more than 90 percent between 2021 and 2022, Olson said. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court is currently carrying out a declassification process for a 2023 opinion that identifies, quote, some additional improvements in FBI compliance, unquote, Olson said. On Tuesday, FBI Deputy Director Paul Abate, I think that's how you pronounce that, announced a pair of new compliance measures that the agency is putting forward as it tries to reduce FISA abuse. The first is a three-strike policy for query-related incidents that could lead to an agent's dismissal. The second involves evaluations that, that can affect performance ratings and promotions for agency leaders monitoring 702 compliance in their divisions. Abate told Senator Cornyn uh, from Texas that the Bureau would welcome codifying reforms already in place into law. Civil liberties advocates said these reforms fail to address the surveillance abuses, including the collection of data belonging to racial justice protesters and political donors committed under Section 702. And this is a quote from uh, Jake Laparuk, the director of the Security and Surveillance Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. And Jake says, quote, the new items the FBI touted at the hearing are wholly inadequate and out of touch with how serious these abuses are, unquote. So anyway, as always, I want to go back to a couple things. First of all, that number, 278,000, that, that's a big number. That's a lot of abuses. But uh, as the old saying goes, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. That statistic, I think, is a little inflated. For example, I think there was one incident that accounted for like 100,000 of those. In other words, I think what they, were, what they were doing is maybe somebody did a search and that came back with 100,000 results. That might be you know, like one query that I'd hunt that, that counted as 100,000 different abuses. I'm not 100% sure on that, but that's, I actually listened to the testimony because uh, I was curious and I've got a link in the show notes if you want to go check it out. Uh, you can put it on 1.5 X speed and get through the whole thing in maybe an hour, or a little over an hour. But there was definitely some question about what that number meant. Nevertheless, this program has definitely been abused and is ripe for abuse. So they should not reauthorize this without some serious reforms. I understand the, the national security needs for this, and I think you could probably carve all of that out and leave it alone. And this would be, you know, basically wiretapping communications for non-U.S. citizens outside the U.S. that happen to traverse cables and wires and fiber uh, that are owned by U.S. companies. But they collect a ton of data, and as I, and their excuse in a lot of these cases is, yeah, we collect it, but we don't look at it. And so until you look at it, that's when you know maybe there's a question about you know needing a warrant or something. And I definitely think that that we need to in, introduce a warrant process is because this is all secret. Again, the, the the targets of these searches have no way to protest them. They don't even know that they're occurring. So there's the secret court put in place that's supposed to represent. You know, this adversary relationship that's supposed to represent the other side of this and try to argue against these things. But in practice, from what I've heard, it never actually happens. You know, almost every single one of these requests is approved. So transparency is a real problem here. And there's a there's a lot that needs to be reformed about this. I think they probably could manage to reform it if they if they put their hearts into it. And it absolutely needs some reforms. But maybe maybe the whole thing just needs to be scrapped. I'd love to get somebody on the show to, to debate that with. But again, for now, if you're interested, uh, you can check out the article. There's more information there. And seriously, if you, if you can spare yourself an hour, go check out and actually watch the testimony. All right, next up, this is actually from the ACLU. It's a rather disturbing story about how donated blood was held onto for a really long time and then used for a DNA test later. And all the other ways that that same kind of mechanic can be abused that, that we need to know about. 
In 2015, following a DUI arrest, Ian Mitchum consented to having a blood sample collected to test for blood alcohol concentration. He was advised his sample would be destroyed after 90 days. Instead, law enforcement held onto it for three years. Then, without obtaining a warrant, a detective used this old blood sample for a completely different purpose, to extract and analyze Mr. Mitchum's DNA while investigating another crime. As we're arguing before the Arizona Court of Appeals tomorrow and set forth in the Friend of the Court brief, this clearly violated Mr. Mitchum's constitutional rights under the Fourth Amendment. Despite this, the state makes a terrifying argument to justify its actions, that it has the power to obtain DNA profiles from any biological sample in its lawful possession without court oversight or approval. The consequences of this argument are chilling. Our DNA contains extremely personal and sensitive information, including information about our medical history, possible future health conditions, ancestry, and physical appearance. It can reveal those details not only about us, but also about our family members, including future children. Combined with other public data, it can expose deeply private information from previously unknown family histories of adoptions, misattributed paternity, risk of early mortality, or siblings we didn't even know about. Given this, collecting and analyzing DNA constitutes a seizure and search under the Fourth Amendment, and the government must obtain a warrant before extracting it. Yet in this case, the state claims that since Mr. Mitchum consented to provide a blood sample three years ago, it can ignore that requirement, even though he consented to the collection only for a blood alcohol test and the sample should have been destroyed after 90 days. With this rationale, all of us who consent to a biological sample collection at any point in time for any purpose to any government entity may be subject to a warrantless DNA search after the fact. This would be incredibly dangerous considering all the contexts in which the government has lawful access to our biological material, from blood taken from newborns, to screen for diseases, to organs donated for transplant, to specimens collected from survivors of, of sexual assault. If the state's arguments are accepted, police could theoretically extract any person's DNA from their biological material and create a genetic profile without a warrant. Without constitutional protection, there may be a greater risk of the government abusing these resources to generate and analyze genetic profiles as they please. Given how law enforcement acted in this case and in other criminal investigations where they collect suspects' DNA without their knowledge or consent from items they discard or throw away, this kind of abuse would not be surprising or far off. Moreover, if our privacy protections erode, so does public trust in these vital government programs. Without this trust, important medical and public health research will suffer. Consent for the government to collect a biological sample for a particular purpose cannot authorize unfettered genetic testing for a criminal investigation. A warrant is required. So I actually skipped over several paragraphs in this article that talked about lots of other places that you, you might not think about where the government collects DNA or fluid or tissue uh, that could then be subject to this sort of later search. And this is another reason why I tell people that they should not participate in DNA-based ancestry programs. Because if you look at the privacy policies on a lot of those things, they can and do share that DNA material with other companies. And so again, we really don't have good regulations or laws around this. Uh, and, and we need some. All right, next up, this is a really interesting one. And this is from Lifehacker. If you've never seen the movie Catch Me If You Can, I highly recommend it. It is extremely entertaining. It's a well done movie. And it's a great kind of profile in social engineering and physical hacking like washing checks and so you could create bad checks. But let me just read this article. If you're dropping checks in the mail to your landlord or utility provider, it's time to look for a different way to pay your bills. Check fraud and mail theft nearly doubled between 2021 and 2022, affecting hundreds of thousands of Americans, according to reports from both the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Criminals are taking sophisticated steps to wash checks, stealing them from the mail and changing the payee's name and the payment amount, and conning banks into cashing them. This often involves creating fake identities using stolen personal information and then opening, fraud and then opening fraudulent bank accounts and writing new checks. Some are selling copies of washed checks online or using stolen mailbox keys to pick checks directly out of collection points. While banks do refund check fraud victims for the money lost, the AP reports that this process is slower than usual due to the significant increase in fraud cases. Fewer Americans are writing and sending checks, but it's still somewhat common. Here's how to minimize the chance of becoming a victim. If you're writing checks to a business that offers a different method of payment via a debit or credit card, an ACH or EFT transaction, or a service like PayPal, Zelle, or Venmo, 
I wouldn't use Venmo. You should almost certainly use one of these instead. You generally have greater fraud protection and visibility into the transaction recipient. Some businesses also work with e-checks, which eliminates the need to drop a paper check in the mail. If these options aren't already available, but you have a personal relationship, such as with a landlord, you could probably convince them to consider a check alternative. It's safer for you and for them. In addition to being stolen, checks can also get lost or bounce. You could also hand deliver checks if the recipient is local. If you absolutely must mail a check, take every precaution to minimize the risk of it being boosted and washed. Don't leave checks in your home mailbox with the flag raised for pickup. Don't even use an outdoor collection box. But if you do, check the pickup time so your mail doesn't sit out overnight. Ideally, walk your check into the post office and place it directly in a lobby drop box or hand it to a USPS employee. This minimizes a few points where people can steal from you. Once you've dropped a check in the mail, watch your bank account until you can confirm that it has been received and cashed by the intended recipient. Sign up for transaction notifications if available so you can catch suspicious activity as soon as it happens, as you may only have 30 to 60 days to report fraud and request a refund. Finally, consider sending checks via certified mail or FedEx to require a recipient's signature. While it won't prevent theft, it at least raises red flags if your check doesn't arrive as expected. So, again, check washing. This is. Uh, you know, a time honored technique by criminals to take a perfectly valid check and change the recipient name and the amount and then cashing that check and taking the money. Apparently, apparently this is on the rise again. I, I, I very, very rarely use checks. And whenever I do, I usually hand it directly to the person uh, I'm giving it to. Usually it's a handyman or something like that. So yeah, I think the real takeaway here for most of us is that we should be using, you know, ACH or EFT uh, bank transfers to pay for these kind of bills whenever possible. You can, you can also use your bank to to send payments, and sometimes those actually do cut physical checks and send them. But the checks created by banks are a lot harder to to, to wash and forge. All right, moving on to yet another rare but weird thing that I want you to be aware of. Probably won't happen to you, but I have heard that it happened to somebody, for example, on a podcast I listened to that was really pretty scary. Uh, and with all this AI voice technology we've got now, it's probably going to start happening more, unfortunately. So let's let's talk about virtual kidnapping. A virtual kidnapping scam is a criminal attempt to extort money from victims by convincing them that a loved one has been kidnapped and they must pay a ransom to secure their safety. The scam can be terrifying for those who fall victim to it. Scammers may clone a friend or family member's phone number to make it seem like the call is coming from their phone, or the call could come from an unfamiliar number. It may start with what appears to be a loved one crying or screaming. Some criminals are now using AI to clone the voice of the supposed kidnapping victim to make the call even more convincing. While real kidnappings are rare, at least in the United States, virtual kidnappings are on the rise. So how do you detect this scam? Stay calm if you suspect you have been contacted by someone running the scam. The scammer uses fear and deception to destabilize their victims and convince them that the threat is real. Even if you know such scams exist, receiving a call from someone claiming they might hurt someone you love can be extremely unnerving. The scammer might begin the call pretending to be someone from law enforcement or another authority figure before pivoting to their threat. Do not give them any personally identifying information like your name, your location, or your loved one's name or information. If you suspect you have received a scam call, the FBI advises hanging up. If you decide to remain on the line and another person is around, tell them to call 911 while you're talking to the scammer. If you're alone, discreetly call 911 from another phone if possible and let the 911 operator hear the call through your cell phone's speaker. You can briefly put the scammer on mute to speak with the 911 operator who may ask you for your loved one's phone number. As soon as you can, try to reach your loved one by calling them or having someone else call their phone or, ch or check their location if they've shared it with you. You can also try to reach someone who would be able to confirm your loved one's safety. Ask to speak with the person they claim to have kidnapped. If they pass you to another person or perhaps an AI bot, ask them a question that only your loved one would know the answer to. To protect themselves from scams like this, some families create code words that only family members would know. The scammer might refuse to put the person on the phone, but still claim to be holding them hostage. If so, ask the alleged kidnapper to describe your loved one's appearance or clothing if you know what they were wearing that day. 
And then they've got this little section with bullet points on preparation and prevention, which we've kind of talked about, but again, I'll go over them briefly. Discuss virtual kidnapping with family members and loved ones now and prior to any travel. Avoid posting your real-time location or travel plans online. Try to avoid posting your phone number or a recording of your voice online. (laughs) I'm screwed there. With their permission, reciprocally share your cell phone location with loved ones using Google Maps, iCloud, or another legitimate tracking service. Say nothing or as little as possible to spam callers so they can't record a sample of your voice. That can be difficult to do, obviously, practically speaking. Um, I generally try not to answer any calls if I don't recognize the number, but anyway. Avoid sharing personal details with people you don't know. Scammers use this information to make their claims more convincing. If possible, make a mental or written note of what loved ones are wearing when they leave the house and where they are going. Obviously, you know, that's nice but it's hard to do on a daily basis. So these are interesting. I I don't want to freak you out. I, you know, this is not that common. And I guess the good news is that in these cases, in, the, in this fake case, your loved one is actually totally unharmed and not kidnapped. But a lot of the points that were made in this article came up exactly from the, the situation that I heard this guy in the podcast talk about. And this happened to him. And this this guy is a technically savvy person, smart person, and was still very freaked out about this, but the person actually did have the the sense to dial 911 from another phone silently and put uh, the scam call on speaker so that the 911 operator could hear what was going on. And in the meantime, the 911 operator in the background was trying to do what they can as far as finding the caller and trying to find out if this person's spouse was okay. Again, turns out the person's spouse was fine. This person was told to get $5,000 out of the bank and to drop off at a certain location. They figured out finally that this was a scam and just hung up on them and then worked with the police to try to catch them. And I can't remember if they were successful with that. But with the AI voice stuff going on now, if if someone can get even just a minimal recording of someone else's voice, they can use AI now to generate some pretty believable sounding audio that would sound very much like the actual person that is only going to get worse. So that's where things like having a code word or something like that, that you could speak that would help identify somebody, or maybe also to tip somebody off that something was going on that might be helpful in situations like this. Okay. Now just for a couple more articles, and these are actually good news. Uh, First off real quick from nine to five Mac. More pieces are coming into place for the gradual transition from passwords to passkeys. Apple already supports passkeys with iCloud Keychain, and now 1Password is launching support on the web for its browser extensions. 1Password passkey support for the web dropped today, and, and this would have been June 6th, in the form of public beta versions of its extensions for Safari, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, and Brave. 1Password already added passkey support to its apps for Mac, iOS, and other platforms. Browser extension support makes using passkeys and 1Password uh, as seamless as iCloud Keychain on the Mac. Through its Watchtower feature, 1Password will also notify users when websites they use have been updated to support passkeys. That feature is currently live in the latest 1Password beta apps. 1Password has been working on full passkey support since it first announced uh, since it was first announced by the Fido Alliance, which includes Apple. The company has also been instrumental in helping websites adopt the more secure authentication password with its passage developer tool. So again, I talked about this recently in one of the podcasts if, and in one of my uh, blog articles. If you have not seen that or heard that, you should go back and check those out. Passkeys are great, and it'll be really good when we have third-party support that'll work across multiple platforms. That's, that's good news. All right, last one here. This is from Wired. Small businesses and community nonprofits are often sitting ducks for hackers, but across the United States, programs are springing up to connect these vulnerable organizations with fresh-faced defenders. College students, local businesses, and other small organizations are facing an onslaught of cyber attacks, but federal agencies like the FBI and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, are stretched too thin to help them all implement basic security measures. To fill this gap, public and private universities are launching cybersecurity centers modeled on law school legal clinics to train students as digital security consultants. In a country besieged by endless hacking campaigns that disproportionately burden small, under-resourced businesses, and with national agencies focused on more serious threats to critical infrastructure, university clinics could be the future of cyber defense at the local level. In just a few months, the newest of these clinics will launch as a pilot project at the University of Texas at Austin, joining other schools 
that have formed a consortium to share ideas and lessons learned. But the UT Austin's pilot program has a unique origin story. It was born out of conversations with CISA's outside advisory board about an even more ambitious idea, a cyber 311 service offering emergency help to local businesses modeled on the municipal hotlines that residents call to report potholes and broken streetlights. Because sending college students to help companies recover from hacks raises a host of logistical and legal questions, UT Austin's clinic will first evaluate the simpler task of offering pre-attack guidance. But the program's leaders say they are still interested in the 311 concept that inspired the clinic. And if they can eventually make it work, it could help make colleges the security backbones of their communities. The U.S. faces twin cyber crises. Companies often lack the resources and knowledge to effectively protect themselves from hackers, and there are too few trained professionals to fill the cyber field's many open jobs. Small and medium-sized businesses fall below a cyber poverty line, and that is something we talked with uh, Josh Corman about, struggling to achieve even basic resilience. The persistent talent shortage, there are an estimated 756,000 vacant cyber positions in the U.S., only makes things worse. CISA Director Jen Easterly has championed the project and recently told the advisory committee that her agency will consider launching a nationwide 311 system after evaluating Austin's new clinic and similar efforts. So this article is actually much, much longer than that. If you're interested in this topic, uh, or maybe trying to see if you could get something like this going in your town, check out the article. Links are in the show notes. All right, so that is your news for the week, and now I've got kind of a special tip of the week. And this is something I've been talking about for several weeks now, and I'm proud to announce that I'm going to launch a new campaign today to give away some of my super cool Dragon Challenge coins. So I wrote an article about this, and I encourage you to read it. I've got one of my special little shortened URLs for this. It's fdsd.me slash quest. And... I thought long and hard about this. I've been thinking about this for many weeks and trying to put together how I wanted to approach this. But the basic idea is this. I have these challenge coins and and the notion of challenge coins already, you know, traditionally, is that they're given away often within organizations or sometimes outside of an organization to recognize good deeds or achievements, sometimes just as a thank you. And I've been doing this cybersecurity and privacy thing for a long time now. And one of the things I've certainly learned over all this time is that it's, there's only so much that I could do personally. And I obviously am doing everything I can to <laughs> help people learn about privacy and security and to improve that whenever possible. But I always want to do more and I want to see if I can incentivize people to go further. But it's actually more than that. Also, as I've been thinking about this and, and I wrote this article, I realized that one of the downsides for me being a podcast host and an author and a newsletter and blog writer is that I don't get a lot of feedback. That's a lot. There's a lot of one way communication, me to you. And therefore I don't get a, a lot of feedback. I get some, uh, obviously I've got the discord service for my patrons. I've got social media. I do get some emails. I do get some feedback, but I don't really get to see if the information that I'm putting out there, if the training and education that I'm putting out there is doing a lot of good. And I would like to learn more about that. I would actually like to learn about people who maybe heard something on a podcast or read something in one of my articles or got something on my book and that inspired them to go do something for somebody else and raise our collective privacy and security levels. And so after much, much thought, here's kind of what I've come up with. I've got these really cool dragon challenge coins, and I would like to give them to people who have made a difference, who have done good deeds, specifically in the realms of security and privacy. And I would also like to learn about the efforts that you guys are doing, the things, the great work that you guys are doing out there. Uh, if you've been going out and doing these good deeds, I w I'd like to know about them. And then when I start getting some of this feedback and start hearing some of these stories, and so I've created a way for people to submit their stories to me so I could learn about what's been going on. And then because I want to recognize this work that is getting done and potentially even reward the work that's being done, I'm going to review these submissions about once a quarter or so and find some ones that really exemplify people going above and beyond to help other people to improve their security and privacy, to protect their devices and to defend their data. And I will choose a subset of these, uh, the ones that I think really stand out, and I will send them one of my spiffy dragon challenge coins. 
I also may announce them here on the air. I haven't quite figured some of that stuff out yet. Certainly, I think the people that I award coins to, I'll probably keep a list of those people on my website somewhere. So you can, so there will be sort of an accounting, a a ledger, uh, a place to go where people can say, hey, that was me. I did that. That's all still a little bit up in the air. And I also know that some people won't want these things mentioned on the air or, uh, or wherever. So I will certainly get permission before I do so. Now, there's a lot of things you could do here, obviously, uh, you know, I've got these great coupons you could download that are full of ideas. That's another, that's one way you could do it. By the way, you could also request somebody else to fulfill one of these coupons. You don't have to just be a giver. You could also be somebody requesting that this be done. If you need help setting up your password manager, or if you want to make sure that your home router is secure, uh, if you want to maybe change to a new browser, if you want someone to help you review, uh, you know, the apps on your phone or the permissions that you've given them, yeah, you know, maybe help you with your social media settings. There's a lot of different things that you could do and you don't have to just be the one doing them. You could also request that someone else do them, or you could actually broker this on behalf of somebody else. If you know somebody who needs help, but you're not the one to give it, maybe you can help be a matchmaker and find somebody that can help them do that. Regardless, at the end of the day, what I would like to happen when this, when these good deeds are done uh, is for somebody to submit that information to me. And if you go to that link I told you about, fdsd.me slash quest, there's a button on there where you could submit the information about the good deed that was done. And again, I will review these submissions and oh, once a quarter or so, I will, re- will pick out some of the best ones and award those people some of my dragon challenge coins. And this is something that I'm just going to plan to do forever. Uh, I have done some limited time promotions of these things in the past where basically what I was doing was I was rewarding people for helping me to help other people by becoming patrons. And that's that's still a great thing. I may still have some of those promotions at some point. But what I want to do is just kind of on an ongoing basis, I would like to know what kind of fun, great, wonderful things are being done out there. People that really take the time and the effort to help other people to be more private and more secure. And I either want to hear about those things and then Uh, Some of those I will pick out for specific recognition and I will send you one of my dragon challenge coins. If you have not seen one of these coins, you could go to fdsd.me slash coin two, that's C-O-I-N and the number two. Of course, that quest link I gave you also links to that as well. You can use the coupons for great ideas. You can also download the, uh, the free workbook that goes with the fifth edition of my book. There's plenty of ideas there too. You don't even have to buy the book. And in my article, I've also got a link to the original give the gift of security and privacy article that I wrote back around Thanksgiving time where I introduced the coupons. And there's, there's some good information there too. So again, the goal really of this campaign is I want to identify people who have gone above beyond, you know, their normal duties to improve the lives of others. And I want to recognize those good deeds where I can. And this will be completely subjective. I'm not going to lie. There's, there's not like criteria I've got written down. This is just going to be, and and I don't know how many submissions I'm going to get. I may get two, I may get 2000. I really, really don't know. So that will all play a part into how many of these coins I give away. I've got about a hundred of these coins at this point. If this is really super popular and this really takes off, I have no trouble ordering more coins, (laughs) but we shall see how this goes. I really don't know what to expect at this point. Now, one more thing I want to say, uh, just, just to be clear, is I, I'm not sure that I will be able to send these things outside the U S it's just really expensive to do so. And the customs forums are a total pain in the butt. Uh, I'm still looking into solutions for this. If I can find somebody who does drop shipping of this stuff, you know, I might try doing that. You know, maybe I could do Canada and Mexico. I could definitely do the United States, but I mean, for example, I I shipped a coin uh, last year to Europe and it was over 30 bucks to ship a single two ounce coin. So it's, it's, it's just prohibitive. I will do it if I can. If I find a great story from somebody, you know, outside the U S I will certainly set that coin aside. You know, maybe I could ship it to a U.S. address that for somebody they know, and you know, maybe that person could send it to them or hold it for them until they come to visit or something like that. If you're going to be in Las Vegas, if you're going to hacker summer camp, or maybe you just happen to live near Las Vegas, if you're going to be there from, you know, like say, you know, August 6th through August 12th in that time frame and you have won a coin and you're from outside the U.S., then I could give it to you personally. Heck, if you're from the U.S., I could hand it to you personally. And then you could cash in your free drink uh, at the very same time. That would be fantastic. But I just, as a caveat, I've got to say that if it, if it's outside the U.S., I'm going to have to just owe you a coin uh, and <laughs> may not be able to send it. Or I'll talk to you. We could, we'll see what we can work out. 
All right, so I, I may revise this as time goes on. This is my first cut at this, so uh, this may change. But this is what I want to do. This is what I'm hoping to do, and we'll, we'll see how it goes, and I may have to tweak the program uh, after I see how things go. So there it is. There's your news of the week and your sort of tip of the week. All right, everybody, that'll do it for this week. Thanks for tuning in couple quick notes before we go um i still need some more reviews they i got a few in there that was great um, but i could still use a lot more my one of my earlier books had like 75 reviews and i've only got like 12 for the new one i know it just came out but i really could use some more reviews of the book if you've read it if you liked it uh, i would very much appreciate a review on amazon for the book also could use some more podcast reviews i think the last one i got for the podcast was in april i could use some more of those as well so uh if you are enjoying this please please drop a nice review in one of those two places Next week, we'll be talking to the folks from the Hackasat program. That'll be a lot of fun and a very interesting discussion. And in the interview after that, we'll be speaking again with Josh Corman. He is a very interesting person, and, and we've got some plenty more to talk about. And similarly, actually, the interview after that will be with Ernesto Falcone uh, from the EFF. But he actually is running for a state Senate seat in California. And so we get into a lot of policy stuff that is uh, very interesting. Soon after that will be DEF CON. I'm working on some really cool interviews for that. So lots of great stuff coming down the pipe. That'll do it for this week. Take care, everybody. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. <laughs>